My name is Marcus Leakes. I am a psychotherapist at Kalanorg Community Health Center in New York City. I am a Black queer licensed clinical social worker, uh, originally from California, currently here on the East Coast. I primarily work with folks in the LGBTQ community um, at the clinic and currently expanding to private practice as well. So, In a couple of sentences, please describe what the MFT means to you. Hmm. Yeah, MFP means community. I, uh, you know, was grateful to be a part of the 2014-2015 cohort. And it was, you know, wonderful to meet a lot of like-minded individuals, um, you know, build some relationships and even some referral networks that I connect with and plug into even to this day. Um, what are some common themes from your practice? Yeah, so, you know, LGBTQ populations experience a range of issues and concerns. Uh, you know, the experience of a trans woman of color and those concerns may be very different from a cis gay white man. And so across the board, some common themes I do see, um, I would label sort of attachment related injuries and really attachment related trauma. Um, you know, there's uh, not everyone, but a number of folks have experienced rejection, invalidation, uh, dismissal, denial of their identity and their experience. You know, and that can be as early as, you know, childhood and one's family of origin. Um, it can certainly be reinforced throughout life. You know, we see bullying in schools, we see street harassment, we see a lot of violence. Um, you know, so that those things can snowball and certainly, you know, lead folks to, you know, internalize that sense that, you know, society views them as less than because of their identity. Um, you know, so really, even now when I see folks coming in, let's say for depression, anxiety, a substance use disorder, whatever's kind of on the surface, often in, you know, underneath at its roots, uh, we find some flavors, some levels of attachment-related trauma. And you kind of alluded to this uh, in the contrast uh, of the population. So how do individuals from minoritized racial ethnic backgrounds experience some of these issues that you described? Yeah, yeah, racial ethnic minorities really experience these issues with the added layer of racism. You know, it's, uh, again, thinking about one's experience, uh, you know, with how the world views you because of your gender and sexuality, add on top of that being, you know, racial ethnic minority, um, it's so relevant even in this current historical moment. You know, racism is so rampant, the impacts of it, you know, are, are truly life and death for a lot of folks. Um, you know, so it, it becomes this added layer. Um, and even within the queer community, there is racism, you know, within our community. Uh, you know, so the, I mean, whether we're looking at standards of beauty and attractiveness or, you know, the data in terms of health outcomes, housing stability, gainful employment, we do see, you know, queer folks of color uh, struggling disproportionately. You know, and even within that, trans women of color, you know, usually being targeted, criminalized, you know, high rates of incarceration, even more so. Um, you know, so it, it really those systemic things just kind of pile on and that that oppression is, um, you know, it's experienced at those intersections of identity. Um, you know, folks of color, queer folks of color right now are showing up for Black Lives Matter, you know, showing up for protests, you know, and that's on top of their ongoing work, you know, that they continue to do for, again, their uh, rights as a queer person. Um, so why is a queer clinic so important for the LGBT? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. I, I have the privilege of working at 
a place where that's kind of our bread and butter. And so a, a queer clinic can really kind of set the foundation and um, create a culture and a space where someone feels heard, feels seen, feels included. Um, and, you know, it, it can be as simple as, oh, okay, I, I can trust that I don't have to explain these things to my providers and I can focus on what my actual issues are. Um, that said, I will say, you know, there are a number of really wonderful cases I've had the privilege of working on. You know, uh, a client of mine came in for severe OCD and anxiety, you know, and over time in therapy, we were working on that. And, you know, because of our relationship, because of the queer space that I work at, you know, this person eventually felt comfortable and safe enough to actually disclose their desire to transition. And, it, you know, I, I love this example because after this person transitioned and throughout that process, we saw the OCD symptoms, the severe anxiety significantly reduce. It was, you know, almost to the point where we hardly even needed to talk about OCD or anxiety anymore. Um, you know, and that, that, you know, really I don't think would have happened if we did not have the safety in our therapeutic relationship and even the safety in the queer clinic, um, you know, where this person could be honest about their internal experience. And, you know, we could even to this day still be targeting, you know, these other symptoms, which actually, in, in my opinion, were more, you know, just a kind of manifestation of this deeper stuff going on. Um, you know, and it's, it's also a great example of, you know, if we lived in society where folks' experiences and identities were valued, I don't know if OCD or anxiety would have even developed for that person you know um so it's it's really valuable really important and and even if you don't work in a queer clinic or a queer space if you create a, a therapeutic relationship that is affirming for people you know then they will be um, safe enough to you know show you their authentic and true self great wonderful um and i think related to to that creating that therapeutic space. So what are one or two things that social workers need to do to develop and maintain a culturally competent practice with minoritized LGBTQ individuals? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are a number of things <laughs> social workers can do, um, you know, to improve, maintain their competence in their practice, especially with queer folks, those patients, those clients. Uh, the first thing I usually recommend to folks, uh, especially other social workers, and really any healthcare professional um, or social service professional is to educate yourself, you know, to not put the burden on your clients and your patients to, you know, tell you, give you the sort of gender and sexuality 101. Uh, you, you don't want to put that burden on them. I've heard countless stories of folks experiencing really awful things, usually due to provider ignorance, you know, being asked really inappropriate questions, um, you know, all sorts of things that, again, kind of get in the way of you doing that important work, whatever your role is. Um, you know, and as we were speaking earlier, you know, our grad programs or um, institutions where we were educated may not have covered these issues or how to work with these populations, you know, so it's really on you to educate yourself um, and not put that burden on your clients. Uh, you know, that's, that's the first major thing. Uh, the second thing I would say is, you know, on a more macro level to look at your systems look at your agencies, your organizations, your programs, you know, because many of these were not established or built, you know, by queer folks, by folks of color. And, and so even in less conscious ways, often we are perpetuating racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and, you know, all uh, various, you know, levels of oppression. And so it really takes active work to undo that to you know create again programs and structures um, where folks feel included feel affirmed are validated 
And, you know, on a concrete level, that can look like looking at your intake paperwork and questions, um, you know, really evaluating uh, your imagery, you know, what sorts of things do you have on your website, in your spaces, you know, what's the client experience when they walk through the door and are they going to feel othered or are they going to feel, you know, oh, okay, this is a space where I can see myself represented, you know, and I think as social workers, you know, it, it is absolutely part of our ethics, our our values to look at these systemic changes, you know, because they trickle down and affect the clients on that individual level. Um, it might even be, you know, conversations with your colleagues, you know, about pronouns and correcting folks when they're saying things that are disrespectful and inappropriate. Um, you know, so you really can, you know, I think there's the your own work individually, but there's also the work on a more <laughs> macro level especially for a lot of us, you know, not working in spaces that traditionally um, were built for folks of color or were built for queer folks um, to look at that more systemically.